people look at me, you know, on the street, people still come up to me and say, oh my God, you look so fit. What do you do? How am I supposed to explain? Mm -hmm. You know? Well, I used to be fit my whole life, and maybe that's still why I look good. Mm -hmm. And also, I eat as cleanly as you can possibly eat. I take care of myself. I take mm -hmm. <laughs> dozens and dozens of supplements. Whatever. I think in a way it's been damaging to me that mm -hmm. I'm attractive and that I'm, I still look like I'm in shape mm -hmm. because that was my whole life mm -hmm. before this accident. So it's like I get penalized because doctors just look at me and say, oh, you look fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like someone who has cancer. What a horrible thing to say to somebody. I have no bowel function. <laughs> my musculoskeletal system is totally screwed up. But you look fine. And you get written off. Oh, the best one is being sent to pain management. Yeah, we're just going to narc you up. We're not going to work on trying to alleviate the simple causes or the known now causes of your pain. We just want to get you hooked on drugs so you really can't function. And I've said no mm -hmm. to that, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> this is what I used to lecture about when I was giving seminars on optimal wellness. You know, now... It's so common that people get addicted to the drugs they're given. Insurance companies pay for rehab mm -hmm. to recover from being hooked on the drugs these doctors give you instead mm -hmm. of dealing with the root cause of the illness. So at any rate, one thing I have managed to do is avoid all the insane things that they try to do. I haven't taken one pain pill since my accident, despite <laughs> having pain on a scale of 10 to 10, because pain... First of all, I want to fix the root cause of the pain. Pain means something. If it's there, and then I do the right thing, and I start to alleviate the problem, then I know it because the pain goes down. Number two, painkillers cause constipation. I don't have bowel function. That makes it worse. When I say that to a medical doctor, finally they're like, oh yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're right, you can't take painkillers. <laughs> or a pharmacist, you know. And then... Um, you know, lastly, obviously, they have a lot of toxic side effects in your body. And my whole thing is I can't detoxify myself without doing all these extraordinary measures because the bowel doesn't work. So at least I prevented myself from having doctors hurt me worse. And I haven't died yet. But I've been at death's door so many times. Laying in my own home, in my own bed, thinking this, you know, tomorrow might be the last day of my life because I'm so toxic in it can't figure out how to get rid of it and no one is helping or the pain is so severe and I know I'm not sure I can get up tomorrow mm -hmm. and get to a treatment <laughs> and I don't even know what's kept me alive so far it's just I think I'm mm -hmm. stubborn <laughs> and I want to live because I was doing a lot of good work before this accident <laughs> and I've still been helping a lot of people somehow during this whole period of my accident, because there's opportunities everywhere, you see, to help people, and I do what I can. And I'm not ready to die, but I don't think I can keep going on like this much longer. And I've said that to doctors, and I've written letters, and I've pleaded for people to help me, and nothing has been done. Even to lawyers, you know, who are supposed to be helping as well, and they've been just as bad. Pretty much, you know, well... You know, they just don't even want to hear the story or think about what they can do to help. It's an insane situation. You just get trapped in this, this web of fraud, insurance fraud, and greed, and malpractice. And basically, it comes down to nobody caring. Mm -hmm. Nobody caring enough to do their job. Nobody caring enough to be a compassionate human being mm -hmm. to help someone else. And I've seen, unfortunately, a lot of people, since this happened to me, who have been in similarly bad situations, and some have already died, because they couldn't get the help they needed. This is a reality of what's going on, and I'm feeling like I'm at my limit to figure out how to handle this by myself. I don't think I can. But I've gone everywhere for help that I know to go for help with no result. Mm -hmm. Core processes don't work. 
you know, these insurance companies have it so figured out. They're so big, and they hire these attorneys that to professionally <laughs> squash people under their, you know, heel and grind them into the ground because that's what they do. That's how they make money. So how is the little person, the person who just paid the premiums and kept them going, how are they supposed to survive? And that is where I'm at right now trying to figure out, you know, how okay. am I going to survive? Okay. So, where are you living now? I live in my car. I live in my van. Which, my loan on that van is with USAA, which is my own insurance company that ignored me. I haven't been able to pay the loan for three months because I am destitute and I have been now for a very long time. And so I'm essentially living in a car that is my home that I don't even own, and I don't even have insurance on it anymore because I couldn't pay the insurance anymore out of three months ago. You know, I've, I've been pushed and pushed, I think it's been a year and a half, I've lived with nothing and done everything I can to sell and scrape by and get on food stamps and all these, you know, horribly humiliating things to begin with, humiliating. They take a ton of work to do just to survive every day to negotiate mm -hmm. that part of it. <laughs> And, you know, it's a struggle. It's just such a huge, huge struggle. So that's, that's what I'm doing to live. And I have um, had opportunities to, like coming out here to San Diego, I can stay at my brother's house for short periods of time. He has a family and kids and they don't even have enough room in their own house for them. So it's difficult for me because it's very uncomfortable for me. I don't have a proper bed, but it is better than sleeping in my car. But my, my food stamps are in Arizona, my supposed health care is in Arizona, um, so I have to also be in Arizona, so it's very difficult to figure mm -hmm. this out. Unless I just somehow say, screw it, and give up all that, because it's not worth a heck of a lot. Anyhow, certainly the health insurance isn't, because they haven't been able to do anything for me. And, um, you know, every now and so, then, I sleep on someone's, you know, someone's yes. floor, but you know what's interesting? It's never anybody who has any means at all, like the attorneys or the doctors or anyone who, yes. for whatever reason, has happened to know what my story is. And I don't go around telling it, but every now and then, someone hears it because of something that goes on. Not one person of any means has said, gosh, do you need a little help? You know, I have an extra bedroom, would you like to stay? It's always been the people who have mm. nothing who have absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. who say, gosh, I'd be happy to share my couch or my floor or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, and I accept that gratefully, and I try to help them with whatever mm -hmm. they need in return. Mm -hmm. But it really makes you question what is going on in this country. <laughs> you know, just the basics of people being kind to each other. It's, it's really challenging to wrap your mind around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what... Um how can I help? <laughs> well, I'm trying to figure out how I deal with this. Because this isn't over by a long shot in terms of what my rights are. I can sue the crap out of USAA. There's not much I can do about farmers anymore. I have all the documentation to do it. It's more of a question of having the energy mm -hmm. to sit in front of an attorney and drag out all the documents. Mm -hmm. I have so many, and they're all perfectly organized. I'm a lawyer's dream for that perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's hard. And it's hard to tell this story and have to tell it. It's like re-traumatizing mm -hmm. myself every mm -hmm. time I even say it. That's why when I go out in the world every day, I get up, and I just get up, and I do what I need to do. I take care of my physical needs. It mm -hmm. takes a couple hours. People don't see me before 10 or 11 in the morning. And then I do what I call... You know, face to the nation. I learned to do this very well as a management consultant. You go out there and you are professional in the world. You are considerate. You are kind. You know, you, you be the best person you can be. Mm -hmm. I can only do that for a couple hours a day anymore. Because it takes so much energy to pretend that I'm normal. <laughs> to pretend that I can function and do this by myself mm -hmm. because I really can't do this by myself. So I'm here because I started having, you know, breakdowns. Mm -hmm. I'm crying for hours at a time. I'm afraid for my own mental capacity 
to handle this and I'm the strongest person I know. Mm.